Uh, so I know we'll lunch to serve a little bit late, and there's still some people kind of wandering in and wandering around, but we'll get started now just to uh, make sure we end on time uh, so we can get everyone to the closing keynote and then to the gala on time tonight. Uh, so, so I'm glad everyone's here for the session, Creating Change Through Social Media. Um, Social media has really taken off over the last while, everything from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, and beyond just social media, online community and online communication in general is becoming more and more of a factor in what we do, in the campaigns we run, in the way we relate to each other and to uh, people at large. So it's an exciting area where we can um, hopefully get some thoughts on, on where we're going and where this area is taking us. Um, the three panelists we have for this session, I'm really excited that we have them all with us. Um, at the far end of the table, we have Paul from Public Inc. Uh, and he is uh, also the former VP of Artez Interactive. Um, so I'm glad he'll be able to bring his experience with us. Um, next, we have Megan, who is currently the community manager for the cabinet, of, um, cabinet office. All right. Um, and is also a self-described e-advocacy person, um, which is a very interesting area that we can, we can uh, dive into. Then we have James from Warchild, who is the Director of uh, Marketing and Communications, um, who has also been active in media, um, in the social media area, also in the, the traditional media area, and can share some, uh, some, some perspectives from the nonprofit area. So, um, to give you a sense of the format of this panel, um, we're not going to start off with a number of presentations or anything. Um, I'd love to get you guys and you guys involved in this to get your thoughts and your questions answered. Um, and really keep this more of a discussion rather than kind of just a presentation where we're talking at you. So I'll start off with a few questions. If you have any questions, if anything they say kind of triggers something in your mind, please feel free to, um, to get me on the microphone there, uh, follow up on things, um, offer your ideas, challenge us, challenge our speakers, and let's uh, get a discussion going around social media. Sound good? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Great <laughs> <laughs> So, um, just uh, to get a bit of background, I guess, uh, what would you say is kind of the, the best example of kind of an online action leading to an offline change that you've seen or that you've worked on in the past as well? Now, maybe start with Paul and yeah, right, me. All right, perfect. And work, work our way down. I mean, I think, it, look, I think, Francis, I mean, you, you, I think you've set up a well at the beginning. I mean, I think this is a very emergent area, and I would say um, not just charities, not just the charitable sector generally, but I would say charities and companies really haven't solved this yet. But I think for me, one of the, one of the interesting examples, at least, of people playing in the area, um, I'll, I'll actually use the Salvation Army, um, and one of the campaigns that they're actually, they worked on over the holidays, a little bit here in Canada and even more so in the U.S., which was actually their, their annual telecom. And what they, what they were trying to do is, was create both a sense of a virtual kettle, so people who want to not necessarily go and actually be physically at all, actually be able to do it in a slightly different way with their own social networks, but I think also using social media to actually kind of influence the physical, right? So people who are actually um, going to be canvassing a physical kettle, like either tweeting or posting on their Facebook page when they were going to be there, so that friends or family might kind of make, you know, if they were out about the holidays, might actually stop by. And I think it's an interesting way to kind of say, how do you, how do you use social media and your social network to, to drive people or make people aware of things that you're actually doing in the physical world? So that's, that for me is one example. Um, the other example I thought is interesting, just quickly, but it's not, it's not a social thing, but I think it is, again, the sense of how do you, how do you start to kind of tie people together? It was really interesting, Lola Palooza was one of the first shows that I'm aware of that actually experimented with with Facebook, um, where what you could do is you could use your Facebook to authenticate when you bought tickets to the concert, and then actually you could see what your friends were doing in terms of which bands they wanted to see, and so it actually gave you an opportunity to connect. And I think those kinds of opportunities where we say, how do you use the virtual media to actually help people connect in the real world, I think will be kind of some of the interesting trends. Um, in part because I don't think anyone's really yet figured out how to monetize uh, social media for, for charitable purposes. A couple examples for me. Um, I have a favorite example that will be fun for everyone to Google when they get home. Um, as a daughter of a librarian, literacy is a cause that's very close to my heart. And there's an organization uh, based out of New York called Improv Everywhere, and they're a fantastic group.
group of uh, very civic-minded uh, improvisers and actors, and they organized these fantastic campaigns, and they were quite upset that the New York uh, Public Library system was facing quite severe uh, budget cuts, so what they did is um, they re, uh, reenacted the very famous library scene from Ghostbusters, and they, uh, before, the, before they reenacted the scene, they had about four cameras set up, all stealth, all gorilla style. Um, they had a, a swath of volunteers, but they, they did not let the facilities people know that this was happening. They did not let anyone else know that this was happening. And throughout the scene, they had a couple people coming in just with bed sheets, just walking around the library, chilling out, sitting down, looking through dictionaries. Uh, and then they proceeded to, to reenact this fantastic, epic scene from what is quite possibly the greatest film of all time. <laughs> um, so, well, we can, we can argue about that later. But, uh, Anyway, they, they packaged this in quite a slick, funny format into a YouTube video and proceeded to generate quite a bit of traffic. It made Laughing Squid, I think it was quite a huge hit on Dig. So um, people at Improv Everywhere have a really important lesson that I think every nonprofit group or every advocacy organization or every political campaign or every brand in the corporate world can learn is that um, pop culture references matter because they're sticky. They, they refer to things that we already know and love. Humor is super, super important. Being fun and lighthearted and punchy, it, it actually endears your cause to, to normal online users. And then capitalizing on the YouTube uh, network, which is totally free to upload videos, they did a very good job of uh, re-recording the Ghostbusters songs. So they didn't have to pay license fees. They, they actually made a ghost bastard style of the song. Um, but just recognizing that there's an entire network of users out there who are passionate about uh, the pop culture things that you love, maybe not quite passionate about your cause yet, uh, and capitalizing on that. So Google Improv Everywhere and Ghostbusters when you get them. Um, I've been trying to think of something that was a really successful social media um, and I couldn't actually think of one. Um, I don't think anything that's been successful is purely just social media. And that everything's it's just this little thing called social media doesn't relate to the real world. Mm -hmm. I think when all this started a few years ago, the most obvious and cliche example of people banding around was the Obama campaign and how Obama had won the election through social media, mm -hmm. um, which is nonsense. Mm -hmm. nonsense. <laughs> 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 Um, because all he really did was use the tools available to do what he'd always been doing, which was community organization. Um, so I'd say that if to try and take social media as a thing on, on its own is a huge mistake. Nothing we've ever done has been, although we have used social media and a number of things, yeah. they, it's always ended up in the real world. Yeah, it's never an isolation. Because if it doesn't happen, if things don't happen in the real world, then they don't really exist. And all the things that when people do try and do social media campaigns, I've always found them to be really gimmicky. Yeah, they're bad. That's why I love the ghosts. Happened in real life, happened online, resulted in a stop in the budget cuts. But um, uh, James should toot his own horn and describe one of the most recent, describe your blogger campaign that was quite successful. Oh, yeah. That's a successful social media campaign. I have a party idea. No, there you go. That helps. <laughs> Um, this was just something we did recently. We were trying to do it two years ago, but we were waiting for CEDA funding. Um, so anybody who's dealt with CEDA, then it takes a while. Um, and the idea was because it appeared to us that a lot of charities um, are very keen to take journalists to the field. Um, but you, Can you speak up a little? Sorry. Um, rather than just take a mainstream media journalist to the field where you'd get a mainstream media report and it's probably someone who's been to this kind of area a lot and seen it all. We thought it'd be more interesting to take someone from just a normal blogger, like an everyday blogger. Uh, so we asked 10 bloggers who, uh, if they would like to take part in a challenge in which they had to blog and or post videos or whatever on social change happening within their communities. Um, actually, in the end, only four of them decided they wanted to go to Ethiopia that badly. Um, and it's 
it turned out really well. It's always kind of hard to know whether these things are actually going to catch or not. Um, but luckily, we had bloggers who got very excited and very keen and used their networks to publicize themselves. Um, and we haven't got the figures in yet, but it's, it, it worked extremely well. Although I had to make the call to tell them the feeling that they didn't make it, and that was kind of painful. Mm -hmm. There was tears from the winner as well, actually. That's kind of weird. Um, so yeah, so it's called the Warchild Challenge. It's at challenge.warchild.ca. Um, and yeah, it was fun. And I guess that was a, a social media campaign, but it, it was also, in the end, in order to go and report on our real programs. Jump on something that, that I heard just now around um, around the idea that social media campaigns on their own actually aren't very effective and they have to come and come from the real world. Uh, what would you say the biggest kind of failure that you've seen in this social media area has been, and what can we learn from it apart from you know, tying the online and online together? To the invention of Twibbons. Twibbons. Twibbons was probably the worst thing that ever happened. Not. <laughs> What is that? So changing your avatar green to support the Iranian people, for example, when in fact the Iranian people can't see you, so all you're really doing is telling your friends how much you care without having to put your hand in your pocket. There was even a token for the Poppy campaign. Yes. Just like it's their biggest fundraiser, it's probably their only big fundraiser, and they gave people the option to do it free. Yeah. It's just it's and I don't know many veterans who are on Twitter who would feel that. No, I, I, I give an example too of. Um, Target well, I got a lot of press of its polls and ideas and which they did through Facebook. And what I found really interesting about it, because we actually were we actually were working with one of the charities that one of those 12 times history. So basically they they issued a challenge to other 12 charities and said over two weeks we normally give away three million dollars a, a week to charity. That's the corporate. Thing. And so basically we'll run a popularity contest to see who which of you gets the most of that. Right? But I mean, the interesting the thing is, they're not giving any extra money. They're just saying, we're giving this money, so fight over it. Um, but what I found really interesting was, basically what they asked the charities to do was to go to their networks and get votes on the target Facebook page to determine you know, who got what the biggest share of that money. But none of the charities got any of the data that came from that. And they had to go to their own networks, pester their own networks just to get votes, to get money the target was already going to give. And to me, and then Target won huge awards for them. So it's just to me, like, what a fascinating waste of an opportunity to actually do something net new and actually give the charity something of value, as opposed to saying, basically, go to the people you're already talking to. Instead of asking them to do something with you, ask them to do something with us, where you're not going to know whether they did it. Like, it's yeah, mind-boggling yeah. to me that that, that, that actually would be a good thing. So, Pepsi Refresh project is yeah. exactly... Well, Pepsi Refresh similar. is very similar. The only thing I, think, I feel with Pepsi Refresh is, because these were 12 main charities, and they were going to their own supporters, at least with Pepsi Refresh, it's mostly small projects. And because it's generating a lot of attention, other people are learning about those projects. I mean, I, I don't think it's correct. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't defend it. Yeah. I, I'm not. We don't like it. But as a step up from, you know, hey, go to your own network, compete for money. That's like it's just uh, so those kinds. Of, so I think it. The part of the challenge, I mean, that beyond kind of Francis, this idea that you need to really try and figure out how to tie the two worlds together. I agree with James. You know, a lot of what we, uh, what we would say too. I mean, Facebook costs 150 million members. What are they talking about? It's only raised 22 million dollars for charity. Well, I mean, at, we were talking earlier at, at 20 cents a member, right? Like, as a charity, you would never, you know, you would never run a campaign when you thought you were going to raise 20 cents for everybody. Um, but, but the, but the part of the challenge with social media is the way a lot of way it's used is um, it's, it's very passive. Like when I put a cause up on my, you know, I put a banner for say it's EWB up on my page. It's not asking people to do anything. It's just saying I'm, you know, within your own social network. So what I found a lot of social media is actually, even though the premise of social media is that it's actually very interactive, the way in which people have used it so far for charitable campaigns is actually very passive. And you know, people don't respond to, to campaigns that generally to charity unless there's urgency and deadline and I mean yeah. you're a point on pop culture. <laughs> yeah. Like and so you know, I think it'll be interesting. I mean you've got the Ava Longoria thing for Haiti, and then again I don't love it. But it will be interesting to see, I think, celebs more and more try and yeah. use that you know, that sense of celebrity. And then I think 
the question is, what's the what's the kind of local celebrity version of that that has kind of pop culture reference to? Yeah. I think another recent failure to highlight that we can learn from is the, um, what was it, I'll Stop Tweeting, uh, the, the, the social media the suicide. Yeah. And uh, we all wanted those celebrities to stay dead, essentially. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> really popped up the coin to, to bring these people back to life. So. Um, well, the one donor stepped in. Oh, right at the end. eventually, yeah. Yeah, eventually matched. I mean, this is Cashed fascinating, it. though, right? Matched $500,000 because that's all they got to, so they actually got a million so they could actually turn it back on. It was just embarrassing. So any NGO that expects um, one celebrity person's brand or identity to fuel a, a revolutionary campaign is, is really missing the point of speaking to somebody about, about what that organization stands for and, and what the integrity of the organization is what's needed to affect social change. So yeah, definitely the, the gimmicks and the bright shiny objects and not connecting it to the, the organization's narrative is, is where social media goes awry often. Yeah, we don't really use it very much for, for campaigns as such. It's more just as like an ongoing, it's just a different way of communicating, much the same way as you speak emails. And it's just what it's, what it's really done, which is interesting, is to um, something needs to be a sermon into a conversation. Mm -hmm. Which is why a lot of charities were so nervous of us at first, because they were like certain mm. but, um, yeah. but for us, it's much more like, it's much more of a way of allowing us, allowing people to get to know us as an organization with a little more personality. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of organizations, some, well, not a lot. I've seen some organizations do it more effectively, and I think about you guys in terms of your chapter structure, really to connect almost, it's almost that inner circle in a way, and to really facilitate that inner, that inner circle dialogue. Um, because you can create interesting networks of people who have kind of like-minded interests. And you know, I was part of a session here on um, with, with some of maybe some of you on Wednesday where we talked about kind of chapters being more connected, particularly in the campus context. And I think as one way of doing that, as one way of kind of meeting and being connected to people who you know you don't know but actually share an interesting you know and sharing ideas and you know what you're doing to kind of activate people on campus. I think those kinds of things. I think you'll see cherries. You know, do more of really again to kind of connect that more than inner circle where that group has a reason to want to talk. And kind of think one of the challenges you have with we're talking this was, you know, um, James was saying, do we create a war child app? Right? Because you get a lot of pressure for a lot of people saying you should. He said, but I, I wouldn't download that, right? I mean, I think you do really need to think about that as organizations. Like, you know, just because you can doesn't necessarily mean that anyone wants it, right? And I think part of the challenge is not a lot of charities create enough regular content mm -hmm. to really maintain a dialogue, yeah. right? And that's, I think, again, one of the real challenges. You kind of, because you live and breathe it 24-7, yeah. you kind of assume everyone else yeah. does. And quite frankly, you know, they're just not that interested. So I think it's going to, you know, the, the Facebook guy that left, it's going to do is the, the social yeah. network for social causes. I personally, I don't see it working. I mean, well, I've never bet against the guy who's made gazillions <laughs> of dollars, but, but, uh, but uh, I just, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we care enough on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis yeah. about being good people to sustain that. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, and if anybody follows my Twitter feed, I can talk about baseball as much as I talk about charity, to be honest. Well, it's a human, yeah. It's, it's just human. more fun, isn't it? Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, question. I think a lot of organizations get caught up 
in the cool factor of being a cause celeb on social networks. We're a trending topic on Twitter. Great. Does that keep the lights on? No. No. Does that make sure that we have a development person or a fundraiser person? No. So I, I don't know if I would say it does harm. It just is very little good if it's not actually provoking people to do something or pony up some cash. Um, in some instances, taking on a new shiny social media tool or property like a YouTube channel to a lot of fanfare. It's almost like opening a store. Like, imagine if you, you had this amazing store and you printed these flyers, grand opening, and you got balloons and a caterer. And then the next day you realize, I have to run this goddamn store every single day? But we had so much fun at the party. So I find that a lot of people approach their YouTube channels that same way, or their Facebook pages the same way. They, they, all they think about is that launch date and that day to tell everyone, we've got this great video, and then they, they have nothing. They have no editorial calendar. They have no sustaining message. They have no call to action. So I don't know if it does harm. It's just it can result in a lot of uh, unmet expectations. Uh, I think a lot of users can just get turned off and say, you know, you guys are all talk no game. You know, I'm not seeing anything or hearing anything from you, or they just simply forget about the campaign or the organization. I think I think to your point around, you know, do some people feel as though that's they're doing something? I think you can get into some of that situation, and I think it. But I think also part of it is, to me, it's being really about well, what's the purpose? What am I trying to do in doing this? Right? I mean, I think. If you look at something like 350, the big climate change initiative that they did, you know, 95 million people around the world, you know, e-clicked to, and I mean, honestly, the government said, you know, to blunt, who the fuck cares, right? Like, like this, I mean, they just did, they totally ignored it, right? 95 million people, right? But it's just because, I mean, honestly, I could do that in, you know, less than a second. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily say that I'm actually committed to that issue. Now. You could argue the other side, though, and say, look, 95 million people engaged with it. And what did they take away from it? And did any of them end up in a dialogue about it? And what are they now doing? So I think, you know, if you said, I'm going to run this massive social media campaign because 95 million clicks is actually going to, you know, force change at a, at a policy level, you would, I would have said, you're crazy. It'll never happen. Like, it just doesn't, we're not there yet. Um, if you'd said, I want to do that in part because I think I can rally a huge, network of people who might all of a sudden now connect to people in a different way and that might inspire change, you know, then I'd say uh, that may have some worth, worth. but so to me it's really just being really clear about, you know, I think, you know, to, even to your point on the blogging, right, I mean, you, you, didn't, you wouldn't have done the blogging necessarily to, to raise money for a war child, you're doing it to actually engage a different audience, right, and so I, to me it's just being kind of very careful and clear, at least until we can figure out, or somebody figures out how to monetize it, that if, if you're going into social media thinking there's going to be a whole brand spanking new channel to raise more money, no, nobody's cracked that code. I think um, I think it does offer some risk. So I think you're right that the conspicuous and passion elements of it, where before you would, you know you would buy a puppy and then you wear it, and you know, uh, now you can literally just put a thing on your back and stuff for nothing. And that's it. You get the same warm, glowy feeling of having done something for charity with that fact you haven't done shit at all. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so I'm interested in the idea of the social media platform and the encouraged people who had read his previous books to rally around a date and a time and a place that was convenient for them and then they talked about the book right after it came out or there's a lot of things you could we can also learn from sports franchises and uh, I'm trying to think about Kickstarter is a fantastic example of an online system where artists and filmmakers and musicians and wacky technologists can put up a project idea and, and get people who they don't even know to start contributing because 
they're always feeding these people with information saying, hey, we just mixed the sound for the documentary, or hey, we just shot this scene, or, you know, it's so, so that's getting like-minded people. Now, those people never end up meeting unless they go to a screening together, or unless they're invited to an event, if they're a top-tier donor. But um, I can't really think of an, on, an NGO that's managed I think that to... Was the thing. I was just thinking, are people doing that? Of the yeah, I, think, yeah, I, say, I mean, I think you're seeing some, where I would say I've seen a little bit of it, again, not necessarily well yet, but a lot of healthcare organizations where some of their populations, I mean, not only is their supporter base interested in the issue, but they actually also are suffering or, or dealing with the issue. Um, it's been an interesting way sometimes to connect those people in a different way, where then they all of a sudden start to realize and dialogue and realize, well, actually, hey, we're in the same neighborhood, or we're in the same community. I think it's one of the interesting things has been, you know, and you can see that in my mind in the, in the sort of in the offline world, if you will, right? And one of the things that I thought was really interesting, where we're um, back in my old job, we did some work with over cancer, and they had a walk. And I mean, the walk was to raise funds, but what they found was really interesting about the walk was actually it turned into much more of a picnic because it's a really horrific cancer and has a very high mortality rate. And what they found is that people, within a community would all come out and by and large they were all affected in some way. But it gave them an opportunity to feel like they were they were not alone. And so I think there is some really interesting potential for social media, you know, in part because it actually can transcend geographies to uh, to connect people who are kind of personally affected by that issue and allow them to have dialogue. And I think it will be interesting to see how that evolves, right? I mean I think um, how do you connect you know, I mean, I'll, you see some NGOs experiment with this, and I don't know if you guys have done this, it wouldn't surprise me if you have, but, you know, kind of war-affected youth and, and kind of uh, Canadian youth and, try, and trying to get them to try and understand each, each other's world. And, I mean, I, you know, I think, and that's not necessarily social media, but it could be Skype, it could be, you know, like we're talking about, like, kind of talking about all those tools. Um, but I think to, you know, to the point that was made earlier, too, sometimes that ends up only being a particular you know, it is, it, it all depends on who actually connects, Columbia example too, I think, where you know, they got something like 12 million people out in the streets of Colombia, um, all as a, a demonstration against one of the terrorism groups, and, and a huge part of it was mobilized through social media. Um, I mean, you'd never get 12 million, you know, you'd never put letters at people's door or whatever and get 12 million people. Um, so, I mean, I think it, you know, in the right context, it can, it can, it can amplify, right? It can amplify an ask. It's just then, what what are the actions that you want people to take, and are you actually reaching that audience? And is it an action that they want to take today? I think it definitely has a way. I mean, one of the useful things, or most notably useful things, we find found with it is the way you do meet people who you never ever meet in this thing. In a completely disparate disciplines. Who, if I just phone them up in the old days and said, could you do this thing for me for free? But I've met people in Toronto that have worked with them on real world things, which I and I would never have met if it wasn't. The thing. And if you look on it as a successful event of that kind, um, the Ho Hotio fundraiser every year, which is a group of people that would never have met or worked together in real life, but then because they they came together to all, to use their free time to organise a what is actually a fantastic event which kind of makes what, over 50,000 a year for food bank. So it's, um, and that kind of, that kind of coming together and just people from different disciplines using their skills to create something better, I think is one of the, the good things that happens as a result. I just want to jump in very quickly there. Uh, we, did, we spent a bit of time talking about how social media it hasn't really been monetized and we haven't really found a way to kind of make money off it. And then here we have an example where they're raising kind of $50,000 kind of just out of, long out of the blue for, for the food bank here. So I was curious, um, what do you see kind of led to that? What makes that different from all these other attempts that haven't really created anything? Because I mean, 
it looks like there is a lot of potential there too. But it's because it's trying to use a, it's a party in the real world that does that happens that they, they organize through social media. It hit a sweet spot also because three years ago the Twitter community was mostly comprised of freelancers, contract workers, technologists, people working where they might not necessarily have had an office environment where they might not have had a Christmas party. So that was a really perfect sweet spot to say we're going to have a Christmas or holiday themed event. And I think it just really filled the need for a big event at that time of the year for a lot of people who didn't have a, a corporate Christmas party. So it's the right place, right time. It's just you know, perfect storm. I don't think of it to, to, sorry, to James's point earlier, which was that as a component of a much broader kind of in the world campaign. So I think, you know, if you would ask my old company, are they seeing, you know, the move from just online people sending emails as a, as a more efficient way than kind of making phone calls or going door to door? Are they seeing now move toward being able to post on your Facebook page, being able to tweet, being, you know, as a complement to, not necessarily a driver, but always coming back to a mechanism that can transact no matter how I find the person. I think we'll see I think we'll see more of that. So as an add on to for people who that's how they like to talk. But I think to James' point, it's gotta still connect back to the way we don't we aren't seeing yet, I don't think at least effectively again maybe hey, look, who knows, is a real kind of virtual campaign with a virtual end date with a virtual kind of self, you know, celebratory kind of comp component that never has that physical component to help drive your I've always wondered, how do you become a YouTube celebrity? Are you a cat? Film your cat, yeah, like, film your cat, film your cat, film your cat, really weird things. Um, okay, like, I, I, don't, I don't need to know how to get popular on YouTube. Like, how did they get money? How did they get people, companies, to give them money to do what they do? Like, I don't get that. Or does YouTube get money? And how do you... Um, I, I don't think YouTube celebrities per se actually get a profit. I think they just well, they do. do. Advertising. You, you, you can apply to become a YouTube partner if you have a certain number of views and certain popularity, and uh, Google will actually share its ad revenue with you if you are a YouTube partner. Yeah, it's a fast company less But I, I don't think it's a real uh, avenue for non But for an individual, yeah. I'm all over it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, working on, I'm working on my views. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your um, son crazy YouTube shit. YouTube did have a contest <laughs> last, I think it was YouTube this year. Um, they had a contest last year where um, a couple of not-for-profits, because I remember um, CCS was part of it, and I chaired their Relay for Life event. And um, they gave not-for-profit opportunities, or not-for-profit organizations the opportunity to post their like sort of their clips on YouTube and then at the end of whatever and kind of like or something. The not for profit organization that the video had the most kids, they put it on the whole thing that you can home page for a week. And I thought that was a kind of cool idea. Yeah. Because if anything it just yeah, it's it's passive involvement, but it's more people that are seeing your sort of like ad and more people that are sort of seeing your spiel and your marketing tools. And I thought that was like a cool sort of yeah, and I, th I think you're seeing some, I mean, I think you've seen a bit of an evolution even in terms of some, some share organizations posting things to YouTube, where it's, it used to be, because you used to only be able to really post the video, you couldn't do a lot of editing, you couldn't like, click through at the end. And, and again, I think it's, for me, it's always thinking about, and it, I think part of you suggested part of the challenge of monetizing Facebook and Twitter, part of it has been the monetization tools attached to those weren't great. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to see where things like Twit, Penny, and Cod, you know, those kind of add-ons, the bolt-ons that actually have the transaction engine built into them, as opposed to, I see something interesting there, and I've got to go 17 clicks to get to the, you know, because and, and and cherries make it really hard too on themselves. I mean, I've seen so many things produced where it's like, you know, you'll see a YouTube video or whatever, and then like, if, if they even get to promoting a link at the end, it's a link to their homepage, not right to some custom page that's about that. <coughs> campaign or whatever. So it's like I go to the homepage and most charity homepages, I mean there's seventy five things on it. So now I'm like looking, 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 trying to find the, you know, whatever. And then when you get to that, they've linked to their normal donation, you know, their standard donation. So it's just like the you gotta be really connected and really willing to kind of you know, 
know, follow that journey. And so to me, a lot of it is also, really when you think about you're in social media, it's how I get people as quickly from that interaction to the action I want to take, which isn't always giving. I mean, it could be signing up to come to an event, it could be volunteering, whatever the action is, it could be signing a petition, but get them right into that, not 17 steps, because I mean, people, I mean, and I, I've really been on one of them, you get ADD, and I've got, you've got, you know. Six tabs open. Yeah, three, yeah, three seconds. Yeah. Sorry, but I think you're uh, there in the back there, but I think you'd be waiting for a lot. Do you see any ways that you could be used to change other than this project? Like, there's a lot of the being Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on advocacy as well. I mean, um, talking to Mercy Corps in the U.S., they're starting to see some. Uh, some value in it, not to say in terms of the e-click, but in terms of being able to understand kind of where people are located. Um, and so what they're doing is trying to target specific districts or kind of ridings or whatever, where they know that they have someone who's, you know, that they could be potentially tilt if they can demonstrate that actually a lot of people in their area care about the issue. And so I think, you know, you do, and so that's, I mean, it's, it's just a different form of letter writing or call calling in a way. Mm -hmm. But it is starting to, I mean, I think there are going to be some interesting things as you start to get into mobile and geolocation and whatever in terms of, and then I think some of the other earlier examples even of the kind of the mashups, right? The getting a whole bunch of people to come to a particular place. Well, what's that for? Is that a peaceful demonstration? Is it a flash mob? Is it something, you know? So I think those kinds of things you can, you know, and, and done right could that lead to a social, I mean, that in itself is probably not social change, but, you know, does it lead there? Um, and then I think it'll also be interesting to see whether, whether or not you can get to a stage where, um, you know, for instance, if I have a volunteer need on a particular weekend, am I out and about, and is there a way, because social media is location-based, to somehow, yeah. right, drive a group of people connected, sort of, again, through that network to network to network to network, to actually fill a short-term need. I think those things will be, will be interesting. None of those are monetary. And then, um, this isn't particularly social media, but I think, you know, um, a lot is made of the kind of buy a goat example, um, right? And the fact that you don't actually buy a goat. Um, but what's been interesting, I mean, I've been talking to a few friends who are working on mobile, on, in, in Zambia on, and uh, in, in Kenya on mobile transactions. And whether whether this is better or not, it's not, we're not far away from, you know, you actually being able to text an individual with a text that is a goat where they go to the, you know, the go store and literally kind of cash it in. Um, I mean, it's fascinating what they're doing already in Kenya, just even locally with, because a lot of the, 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 um, the fathers or parents will, will work in a very different place in the country. They'll work in the mines. And so getting money home is hard. And now you can actually go into a variety store with your cash pay, get a tax credit, forward that text to your wife in a totally different village. She goes into the, um, the corresponding variety store and they give them cash. Like, I think it'll be really interesting in my mind to see how that whole world evolves mm -hmm. of the kind of micro one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. which might be cash, but could be lots of other things. So I'm just curious to know what people can do, what other people are doing, what I was going to think another sort of geolocation yeah. mobile a social network that's really affecting change. Just got funding from O'Reilly this week is uh, C Click Fix. Um, really heavily reliant on mobile phones and it encourages people in all their communities if they see a problem uh, in terms of infrastructure, pothole, graffiti, broken windows, so on and so forth, to take that picture, upload it to the network, uh, add a caption. Then either it's municipal workers if they can, you know, smart municipalities are already monitoring and assigning these tasks to their staff, but quite often community volunteers are monitoring this as well and if they have time and the energy, They'll go and perform this act, you know, as hard or as easy as it is themselves. So that's another example where there, there is this network of people who are civic-minded. They love their neighborhoods. They they want to stay on top of things. They might be a bit disgruntled in terms of the public service um, and the, the the city workers, and, and they're keeping track of this stuff. So just wanted to share that case study. Yeah. And then your question about what can you do or what can you do. Um, and I assume that's as it relates to mostly to EWB in this context, but it could be other things. I mean, I guess for me, part of it would be to say, to really think about what are the actions that 
EWB really would love for you to take in your community and among your social network? And then how do you use your social networks to drive people to take those actions? So to me, it's, um, I, I was trying to go back to the kind of, you know, EWB is a great organization and it's already identified all kinds of ways in which you can have impact for them. And so to me, the question then becomes, how do you take those and make the shortest path from you and your network to that action? Yeah. And to the extent that you can help them think about how do I make it feel more collective? How do I make it feel like, how do I know that there's a result that's been produced? How do we create some incentive? How do we create some competition among different social networks? Like I think all those dynamics still drive behavior. And so thinking about how you can, you know, how you can come up with ideas to do that, but not necessarily trying to come up with ideas for the action. I mean, although you also want to contribute to that, you want the entity to provide the action to you can help to shape those, but then it's how you get people to take them. I think is social media is just one of those angles. Yeah, I think you don't see social media as just another tool. It doesn't, uh, I think it's a mistake to see it as the, you know, the great white hole of charity. It's, um, it's more that you decide what it is, what, as, so it's where, where do you want to go, and what do you want to do at the end of it, and will, does social media help do it? And it might be that it doesn't. It might be that a letter writing campaign is actually the best way of doing it. But sometimes social media is a quick way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But don't start off with a, I want to do something through social media. I think it, will, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talk a lot with groups to say, well, what's, the, what's the end result that we're trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. and, and really trying to understand well, what, how would we achieve that end result? And then, to James' point, can social media help us get there? Either in and of itself, or as a tool to mobilize people to do the thing that we actually need them to do. And I think, you know, really thinking about how you bridge those two worlds, I think is actually really interesting. You know, and, and it might, you know, it could, look, it could be, again, think about it creatively. It could be, you know, um, if, if let's say the process of doing something is more complicated than you initially thought it would be, well, I mean, literally, could you create a little YouTube of kind of like, here's how you do the thing, right? <laughs> and then post that and encourage people to go, like, anything you can do to help people do what's needed to be done easier, faster, right? So all those things matter. So I think there are lots of creative ways it can be used, but it's not necessarily the end. I don't know if that helped answer. Yeah, there. Yeah, I think we We've been talking a lot about how charities or us, us being like people in PWB or another organization can use social media. And I guess I'm asking more about so the other side of that, like how do you see users of social media, uh, like the recipients of these campaigns, how do you see it impacting them or changing? Do you think it would change their perceptions of like the charity field or scene or something like that? Or because it is the internet and social media is a way of disseminating information, and it does change change people's perspectives on things. And so one thing that I'm kind of thinking of is there is like in back in the fall on Facebook, people were changing their profile photos to like cartoon characters. Mm -hmm. And it was like to like raise awareness so about like children. <laughs> was that the creepy yeah. But 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 I noticed on my like Facebook feeds a lot of people were posting like um, links <coughs> to groups that actually fundraise and help child abuse victims and saying if you actually want to do something about this, don't just change your photo, go here. And so that was very user recipient yeah. driven. And so I'm wondering if you think that social media and these social media campaigns that are being run would change the recipient side of things as well. well I think that was a, I don't think that whoever did that campaign can claim any credit for that. Mm -hmm. like, this is a garbage campaign. What you should really do is this. Yeah. It's um, like bizarre overall success. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I, just, I mean, I think what people always forget, or often forget, is that it still comes down to content, and it still comes down to what it is you want to say. Yeah. It's like, the amount of time, I mean, cause I remember Sam Nart, who's our founder, went to, he was one of the first charity people to tweet from the field, he was in Darfur, and they got a huge amount of press and attention probably because she was third, but also for, it's because the content was really remarkably effective and actually quite moving, which is odd in a tweet. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's going to be a lot of other people gone and done the same thing. 
But if they have nothing to say, it doesn't matter whether they're in Haiti or Darfur or yeah. London, Ontario. It's like you, you have to have a message. You have to be able to say, you have to be able to express yourself and have a reason for doing it rather than just doing it because you're there. Yeah, I guess in terms of affecting users or the audience from a social media standpoint, uh, one interesting uh, campaign I'd point to is one of my favorite NGOs of all time because I love Rob Dyer, who's an absolute doll, is the Escape for Cancer campaign that they did. Now, they've done so many different ones. Rob tours with bands, Warp Tour, he's gone across Australia and New Zealand and shot documentaries, went to go to France this summer. This is somebody who has skated coast to coast on a skateboard who has wonderful sponsors through Circa, the skateboarding shoes company, a lot of interesting, like, cool sponsors. Uh, like, I don't know how much cash they're actually shelling out, but um, that brand and that audience is very Vans work Tour, tattooed, we're cool guys, we're tough, but we're gonna, we're gonna help out Rob. Now, when Breast Cancer Month came up, Rob was faced with an interesting dilemma. Now, I'd say about 80% of his uh, allies and friends are dudes. So he had a really fantastic uh, clip. Uh, I forget the name of the agency that helped him do it, but uh, it was with a guy, like a nasty dude giving himself a breast self-exam and completely demonstrated it anatomically well. And there were kittens. There were lots of kittens in the video. <laughs> <laughs> And it just hit that YouTube sweet spot of it's kind of weird. It already had a sort of a built-in audience because Skate for Cancer has a really strong, uh, strong support network online. Like their MySpace is still thriving. Uh, Rob's Facebook page has already reached the maximum. He had to start a new Facebook page because he has too many supporters, um, which is a good problem to have. And his YouTube channel's got a really high subscriber rate. So it's knowing your audience. I think you can actually change your users' behavior when you know them really well and you don't. These guys aren't going to want to talk about breast cancer. How do we make it funny? Or how do we add kittens? Or how do we, how do we make this an accessible subject so that we get them thinking about it and get them talking about it? I, what I was asking about, but I need more instead of how are they going to change their user's behavior if they know their user more, do you think users are going to change their behavior because of what they're seeing? So like what with like that more that kind of thing. So changing the actor. I think, it's, I think it's possible. I mean, I mean one example, I, would, I mean, they're not, I don't, again, I don't think they're great examples, but I think, you know, one of the questions becomes in my mind, and this goes back to even thinking about how you think about a lot of donors and supporters in the kind of, in the offline world, right? Or people who are engaged with the organization. A lot of it is thinking about how do I recognize and reward and incentives and whatever. And I think it's, to me, it's the same thing in social media. I mean, the behaviors don't change. It's just the kinds of incentives and rewards and recognition they change. So I think what's what's interesting is to think about, again, I'm not sure anyone's done it particularly well, and I'm not sure I have the answer yet, but you know, how do I make, how do I help make you somehow a star within your social network? Whatever that means. I don't necessarily mean stars and a celebrity, but like, how do I help you kind of either carry out an interesting dialogue or show a different side of your personality or I mean, all those things that actually then adds value to you. Um, because I do think, or, or it gets you more engaged in your social network or uses, you know, gets you to use your social network in a different way um, or gets you to think about you know, how, could, um, how could being involved with the organization, you know, like I see it more and maybe even in a LinkedIn kind of environment where you know, you're a student and part of it is you're prepping for jobs and so you're building that network and how can a charity provide, you know, you were really engaged in the chapter and so you've got interesting experience and so I provide a testimonial and I, like, I think there are interesting ways to, to do that which give you, you know, the user value which then maybe changes the way in which you talk about the organization. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I'd say, you know, none of those things are easy and they're not one size fits all. So I, how, as a charity, how much resource would I invest in that? I don't, I don't know yet. But I think it's going to be interesting to see how you know, again, it's um, it's not, what I think is really interesting is so many people still think of Facebook as a massive social network. And it's so not a massive social network. It's millions of teeny tiny social networks. And so, so organizations and companies that kind of think they can kind of plop into Facebook and instantly have conversations with millions of people, you just got it wrong. And so I think what's interesting is how do, how do you empower a bunch of people in a bunch of tiny networks to have that ripple effect? Right? To become slightly more of an ambassador for you, again, within that tiny social network. And understanding, 
there's no way a person's going to do it 365 days a year. It's, it's just it's not interesting enough to their social network. So how do I kind of kickstart it and then let the kind of ripples yeah. happen as they do? Even but, a network like Foursquare that's based on rewards and points and badges doesn't have a mass audience, but some NGOs are keen and have set up, uh, if you check in here, where we've put our advertisement in a subway station, uh, this is happening more in San Francisco than in any other city, so it's probably one of the biggest user bases versus New York for Foursquare, but um, you already know that, that people are checking into Foursquare. So, and, and you know that Foursquare users are addicted to badges and points. So by this logic, I know that if I attach donating to my charity to points and a badge, and these people are already checking in, I might be able to reel them in. So maybe sort of reverse engineering, understanding how the users are already behaving on the networks, and then attaching incentives and prizes and benefits to that can get them changing their behavior. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so one thing that we're saying is how on, online only campaigns really work and social media isn't kind of just the only thing. But one thing you see very often is social media is still tied in very much with the kind of marketing and communication side of the organization. I was just curious to get your thoughts on on how that can be bridged and how that can be kind of broken down so it's not siloed off. Because that I'm gonna guess that's one of the reasons why many organizations may look at social media as kind of its own online campaign. Maybe I'm completely off on that too. there's probably some truth to that. I mean, again, I think, um, to me it's more, I, I see some organizations, particularly bigger organizations, you know, you're hiring a social media person with a view that social media is gonna be itself, like, okay, help us come up with social media stuff. Go, go off in a back corner and kind of come up with it, as opposed to actually saying, I'm gonna hire someone with social media skills and actually bring them into the team that's working on all of the things that they're, you know, so, Yes, not just from a marketing communication perspective, but quite frankly, even if we got that right and said, actually, let's let's work together. You're a person that understands that world in a way that you know maybe I don't or I don't want to. Um, and so, to me, it's actually getting it's it's getting those worlds to work more closely together and not and not treated as because I think even if it's treated, quite frankly, as its as its own way of an engagement tool or its own way of an education tool, it still misses the for me the mark, which is actually. You, you, um, you involve everybody in it. It's not that social media is uh, just being engaged to all their three departments and our chances. Ideally, it's, it's a battle. Yeah. But then it's always a battle to get my feet to engage with the real world. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, but it isn't. I mean, I've seen, I've actually seen it in the PR companies where the digital team in one corner and the mainstream media campaigns in another corner, which strikes me as mad. But um, if it happens there, then they're actually at the forefront of them. It's a, it's a tricky thing to actually make people within the organization realize that they have to become part of that conversation as well. Yeah. Well, I think also, one of the things I would say to you is, I think unfortunately we've developed a perception around online engagement that it's, it's real, right? And so, you know, it kind of doesn't cost anything to, to try stuff. And yet, I think, you know, to a lot of the industry, you said it's not some of the risks, and even the fact that it takes real people to actually manage it, um, it is one of those things that you really want to do. You really do want to try and integrate in because you want to make sure that actually the whole thing is It's not free. It takes a lot of resources, and it gets stigmatized by the tools. People misperceive what social media is uh, by assigning it to a Facebook page in their head. And, and we used to have a saying that um, at HMA, one of my former agencies, we had to give away social media sprinkles before we were allowed to be part of the social media. communications dough. But it really needs to be baked in. And often it has to start with sprinkles. It has to start with a Facebook page. It has to start with a one off to expand Eventually, it becomes part of the organic planning and strategy. Maybe just one last closing question that you were saying. Uh, these people have misconceptions of on what social media is. Um, maybe just going down the panel. What do you think social media is, and what do you see as the biggest opportunities for it uh, going forward? It's a communications tool, like a pen, really. It's just, and it allows you to speak to 
to network a large number of people and engage with them and allows them to engage more with your organization. Which is a good example of that. Yeah. Which is good. I think the, the biggest opportunity with social media is the real time feedback. And that you can beta test messages and ideas and not completely commit, and that it offers a lot of collaborative options. I think I would probably echo a couple of things that were said. I think it is an interesting two way communication channel. And I think that's true of a lot of online journey, and that's not something we've had for very long. Um, and so it does really allow you to actually engage with the group of people here, right? The group of people at this conference and a lot of tweeting, and, I mean, all that already happens. So to me, you can't, you can't afford to be just a broadcast voice anymore. So I think that's interesting. I think the other thing is it actually done well. Um, it allows not just you, but also your users to show a lot more of their personality. And so I think it actually can be an interesting tool to really start to think about much more so what's, what's your voice and what's your personality and what are you going to try and get people out, what dialogue you're going to try and um, and to James' point, a lot, get a lot more of your organization involved in the in the voice of the um, I'm going to pick up the Red Cross Canada, which is a huge organization. I feel like I have much close relationship with now, it's really the reason it's like that to use. Because I have a conversation with a person, I was just the big Red Cross. I think the noise from outside is uh, telling us that our time really is up. But I do want to thank our panelists very much for taking the time.